Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discord Discourse, episode 20. We hit the big 2 Oh, We're almost old enough to drink. This is fantastic. I want to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you, Deadpool, Osnick, Kaz, Faye, M. Xavier, and Vanny Vanispheres. We're here to talk about nerd shit. We're getting to the nitty-gritty details of D&D, specifically the adaptation of Critical Roles. Um, uh, Legend of Vox Machina, which we have just recently seen uh, the last six episodes of. I highly recommend checking out. I believe it was episode 18, so two weeks ago, where we talked about the first six episodes. And, you know, I have to admit, I was like, you know what? I was, I was kind of iffy on it. But as the series went along, by the time we got to episode three, I got more into it. And episode four, once they had those ghostly specters come in and that were great animation and the horror, I was like, okay, now I'm really digging this. But I can safely say right now, at least for myself, um, for these last back half, I can firmly say I'm a huge fan of the legend of Vox Machina. Uh, just the amount of depth, the the animation, the choreography, the promises of what we could potentially see in the future, the setup for future seasons. It has me very, very excited. And it's also this, I have to say, these these last six episodes have even changed my minds on my my mind on certain characters that I I was not a big fan over i just wasn't digging i just didn't understand uh and of course i want to get into more details about that with with everyone and kind of ask everyone's opinion on certain characters and things but i i can i can say that this has been a great experience it's been a kind of um uh and kind of a reintroduction uh for me to the world of D, which i always thought like oh, i'm an outsider i don't really understand it but i have to admit it's 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 made me a fan of of critical role and it's kind of renewed my interest in it maybe someday pursuing that um yeah it's i think this is a this is a great gateway to dungeon dragons perhaps the greatest gateway to dungeon dragons ever outside of maybe video games that we've played you know fantasy rpgs and that kind of thing like i i have a, a lot of respect for the show and the talent behind it and um i've been very in impressed overall and i kind of want to go to each and every person that we have here and just get their general thoughts on this season i think for today we'll start with deadpool i know you're a huge critical role fan you're a fan of dnd among uh, other people here today too but i want to kind of get your general thoughts in the last back half of episodes for the legend of vox machina well it i it's i think it's great <laughs> like mm -hmm. i mean Going into it, I know what's going to happen because I watched when they actually streamed right. it live. So not a lot of surprises me because, I mean, they stay, they're staying fairly true to what happened during the show. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, they can they contrade it. They 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 streamlined a lot of it. Sure. Because with D and D, there's like they stream for like four hours. That's so a lot. you have to yeah per per session. So you kind of have to streamline it down as much as possible. So yeah, so they 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 move some stuff around, change some minor characters a little bit, but for the most part, they're hitting the same main story beats that they hit. Mm -hmm. And it, that just kind of adds to because like they're improvising all this on the spot when they were doing it live. Right. So it's interesting seeing them take that raw improvisation and just then kind of like kind of refining it for a show and reducing it down so it can fit in a season because with with their stream like it goes as long as they want it to go sure but with the show you you have a fine amount of time you have to tell the story but it's really interesting to how skillful they were able to take all that all that uh that um content Material. able to trim it down to fit and be coherent yeah, I come to your point. I um after watching the series, actually what not not even after, what what while I was watching the series, I had started looking into kind of like their videos or their best of co clip compilations. I think that's like a good way to introduce yourself to something. And I noticed some of the stuff that they had like in those clip compilations that is in the actual series, those those segments and how it's like, oh, I see what they took from this, all of this material, and as you said, fine-tuned it for this, truncated it. And, um, you know, just maybe just, you know, uh, improve the the dialogue or the sense of story structure. And so, yeah, to see that it was always right there. It's um, it's, it's just a cool way to adapt something. Yeah. And even then, there's still some some moments where I was kind of caught off guard a little bit because right. I didn't realize they moved some stuff around. Like the episode was scaling goes on his little commando mission. The sh the way that it's structured when they did it live is very different from how they actually showed it in the show. They moved a mm. bunch of stuff around. Like right. it opened up with him turning into the Triceratops and smashing into the building first. 
when that when they moved that part to last. Oh, interesting. So yeah, it was kind of interesting to see how they kind of rearranged a lot of it and made it work. I can kind of see why they did uh, did that as well because that is that. I mean, you got to end with a huge finale, if you will. Uh, and you know, to start with that, you're like, oh shit! It's then what are you going to do afterwards? <laughs> because that was such a great surprise and reveal for people. They turned into a purple tr- triceratops that you know just mow down all of these uh, guards. So yeah, it's it's funny how they've maybe even looked at like, oh, maybe we can move that this around to to here or whatever, or put that first or put that last. So I like that. I like that. Any other um, thoughts though on the uh, the last six episodes? It's just like um, I was really looking forward to, especially the final battle with uh, with the Briar, which is really right. interesting. Just see that showdown, and then how see Percy's arc throughout this out the first mm. like sh- season. It's interesting because. When they first introduced the sh- the stream, they had a completely different storyline beforehand. Before all the that took place between the Blue Dragon part and the Briarwood part, right. where they went to the Underdark to save Lady Hima, the one little halfling warrior that's part of the Council of Tadore. Mm-hmm. So, and you got to know the characters a little bit then, like you got to know Percy and all them. So it's interesting seeing them kind of skip that part and go straight into Percy's story where. You like before you kind of got to know him, and then you got to see him change. So I was a little hesitant about that, thinking would it have the same impact? Or the fact yeah. that you're you're kind of being introduced to the character, and then seeing this change rather than knowing this character for a little bit, and then seeing him kind of go to his dark side. But I think for the most part, it worked pretty well. Yeah, I can you know I I because I you you and I think uh, perhaps I'm Xavier and Austin had brought this up before in uh, in uh, episode eighteen that. That they skipped over a particular um, arc within, I guess, campaign one. It's because they had a falling out with a certain member, I guess, and uh, they just didn't cover that. Uh, and I have to say, you know, I, even though I don't know about that, I I do feel like because I want to talk about Percy because he's probably my favorite character in the series so far. You know, that'll change over time, but I just thought he got so much development. I loved his 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 arc and and what he was is is going through and dealing with his literal inner demons. I thought that was really uh, fascinating and sad and tragic. Um, but yeah, I didn't, I didn't feel like, um, they skipped anything with him. I felt it was told very organically. I thought we got so much more details uh, about him than maybe anyone else. Not that we didn't get developed from other people, but I, I, I thought it was handled well. Um, any, any thoughts before we uh, move on to another person? No, that pretty much sums up my feelings where I just interested to see what the people who aren't experienced Crickle Roll have to think of it. Nice. Yeah, I'm actually curious what the because yeah, outside of you guys, I don't know what the general reaction to the show has been. Um, the people who are not yeah, as you said, not even fans of Critical or even know what it is. Uh, that'd be I'd actually be interesting to see what people uh, think about it. But uh, moving on to Austin, Austin yourself, so you're a D and D fan. What have you uh, liked about? Have you enjoyed the the last back half of the Legend of Vox Machina? Uh, I have, I would, I would give it two thumbs up, you know, nice. uh, I really, I, you know, I thought those first two episodes, they were fine. They were good. Mm-hmm. But I think once they hit episode three and kind of, it, it kind of set down the trajectory of what would happen for like the rest of the season. I thought it got a lot better and a lot more interesting, especially because when it focused on Percy, but also when it gave everyone else, it felt like everyone else had a really good moment in the show. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think as well as, as to kind of what Deadpool said, I think they did a really good job of uh, taking stuff from D&D and putting it into the, into like the story. <laughs> like uh, the best way to take down a barbarian is just to, is to like literally mind control them because they're very hard and they have a lot of health. And like, yeah. that's what you think. No, no, I was going no, to say interesting. That's all. And like uh, the mute spell that on like a spell like that is like that is a, a, a strategy people do use in D and D. And it's no. even even someone uh, my friend uh, pointed this out to me, who's also a big D. The way like uh, Scanlan sees someone using a spell and then uses it himself. I like they do they do a lot of things where you can tell they're referencing like the game, but mm-hmm. also it is very again organically we woven into the story and very fun and. Uh, very well animated too. Like I know, I I, I think my one complaint was like uh, sometimes uh, things look like they're they're CGI, but they don't blend as well, and you can kind of tell. But you know, agreed. But like certain fights, it's when it's just two D. It's it is phenomenal. Like the fight with the Briarwoods is amazing, and it's mostly just a lot of uh, people fighting each other in different spaces. But the like mm-hmm. 
even when you see like a, a, a smaller character fight a bigger character, you don't really see that in a lot of media, like in that kind of honest, honestly, like anime uh, animation style where it's, it's usually two people who are like kind of evenly matched or evenly sized. So I, that's what I, there, there's, I think a really a lot to enjoy there. And just, I, you know, be, oh. no, I'm sorry. Keep going. Oh, and I think just as well, because I think everyone, uh, they seem like they've played these characters for so many years that they're just kind of, they know the voice, but the acting and the line delivery, like, uh, I mean, I know Talson Jeffrey's done a lot of anime and like, I think at a lot of people, he was one of the people I didn't really know going to the show. Uh, mm-hmm. Same. He does some flawless acting as Percy. Like the the dialogue he's reading and just the the way he says it, and it's just really it's just really good. And it's hmm. no, and, I'm, oh, I'm I'm right oh, there with you. Okay, oh, keep oh, going. I remember what it, uh, and even like the people that get to play the the other characters who isn't just Matt. Like they got, I'm like, wow, this show's like they got Stephen Root. I know you said earlier, and uh, mm-hmm. oh, I thought drum. Okay, no. Uh, you're yeah, Stephen Root. They get um, uh, Kelly Hugh, who's uh, Cheshire and Young Justice, and a few other people. Um, Gray Delisle does great as Delisle. Uh, great, and, great Griffin is Delia Briarwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just uh, even a uh, Kari Payton is like the the king, who's even even though he's not really in it too much, he, he still does a really. Good yeah, job. <laughs> no no but it's just an overall i uh, uh really enjoy i would on like the dt scale i would give it like a full price nice yeah and i'm yeah i'm excited for a second season and to ex- see more of these other characters backstories and kind of uh see what's gonna happen yeah i i feel like and we can get more details later on like they definitely leave us with a cliffhanger like they wrap up a lot of the Briarwood stuff and um, then it's like, oh shit. And then we're kind of returning back to this other thing that was more focused on the first two episodes. So that has me really interested to see what direction that's going to go in. And you're right. I get th- this was very much a Percy focus season. I'm sure he'll get more development as, as we, as we go forward, more things to do, but yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if they, if they have like the next season, it's more focused on maybe one of the other, maybe p- perhaps, um, Vex and Vax, since they're a whole deal of dragons, and that's kind of hinted at what's going to happen in season two. We'll de- deal with more dragons, which I think would be really interesting. Uh, but no, thank you. Thank you uh, for your thoughts on that. Uh, Kaz Faye, your general thoughts on the back half of The Legend of Vox Machina. Okay, well, um, first of all, say my Discord randomly went out for a second there, so I did no miss problem. part of what Austinic said. I'm, I'm sorry if I end up like repeating anything. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we're hearing you good. You're hearing good. No problem at all. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, Overall, I was very impressed by this half. I think this is when the ball started to get rolling story-wise. Like, mm. um, I think you said earlier, Chris, maybe it was before uh, the recording started that episodes felt longer in a way. And I kind of felt that too, like in a good way where um, the story was just flowing together. And there were moments where I felt like I didn't know what episode I was on because I was so engrossed in the whole thing Mm. and the world and the characters. I feel like the character development and the world building is starting to really more rich, you know, Mm -hmm. I I can see this developing a fan base outside of critical role. Which is, uh, which is so much fun because, you know, that, that shows that you have a very successful property where you don't have to. That, that, that is what, what makes this such a great adaptation, I feel like, because I didn't feel lost while watching this. You know, they, they had the D&D stuff in there as, as Deadpool and Austin brought up, but they made it very accessible and it didn't feel like I was being talked down to. It, it, it eventually actually was, it was like, oh, we're kind of letting you in on the joke now, too. It was like, oh, I'm, I'm a part of this now, and I, which is, you know, kind of what I, I always feel so intimidated by D and D because of the fact that it feels so complicated. And because you have these people that don't want to include like new people into it, not like saying that that's everyone D and D, but uh, we always get that sense, right? Always that intimidation factor. And so to have it where you can, as you said, just, you can enjoy this without knowing what critical role is or really know anything about D and D. That's what makes it so special. Makes it so great. Yeah, I agree. Any other? Uh, do you have any other general thoughts on like the the back half of the of the season characters or something like that that stood out to you? 
Um, I feel like there were a lot of character interactions, like mm. a lot of great teamwork moments, especially like in the acid scene. A lot oh, of yeah. Cause that, cause these guys, these characters keep getting into these situations that seem impossible to get out of and somehow they manage it. And just like the thing with Scanlan and the hand and then, um, <laughs> yeah. And then Pike reappearing. I really loved how she came back. They, I just, um, I just like the way it, the character act more, especially ones that didn't like each yes. other. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed that too. Um, we can get into more details about that as well later on. Like I like that we had uh, uh, Keyleth and um, uh, uh, Vex, and how they were, you know, where Vex has a dislike for for Keyleth, and we got to see more of that relationship, and they became more friends towards the end of the season. Um, you know, I like that, and you kind of understand same. why she is so cold towards towards Keyleth because she knows her brother has affection towards her and Keyleth doesn't really reciprocate that and she doesn't want her brother to be hurt and I thought oh I, I, I get it now and it makes more sense it makes more sense as, as these episodes go along yeah I feel like um, as the series went along we got to know more of these characters and they be, they they got more depth and where I thought certain and I want to you know talk about one person in particular and so you guys have already mentioned that person and I've already talked about them to a degree but uh, they, they they're, they're not one note you think that they are, but they're, they gave them enough to do where it's like, all right, I see what the, the long play was. So, no, no, uh, great points. Uh, and I'm Xavier. I know you haven't finished watching the, uh, the entire series or the, the last back half, but of the ones that you have seen, what are your general impressions, general thoughts? Um, so from what I watched so far, I do really like the show. Um, I'm one of those people who don't know anything about D and D because I think I said this on the last episode. Oh, okay. I, like when I saw, like when I saw the trailer for it, I was like, "Oh, this is just a you know a fantasy show, like similar to like Game of mm -hmm. Thrones or Lord of the Rings." And um, and like when they had Scalin and like you know he was singing and he was rapping and anything like that, I was like, <laughs> "Oh, okay, that's just like their creative way of doing that. They're gonna be like, we're gonna add this in here and you know sure. just like it or don't like it, whatever." Um, but yeah, no, I, I I was really enjoying it. Um, I was one of those people who didn't, who wasn't really understanding the point of scaling, and but then I really liked his episode, especially since like everyone was like, you know, just shut up and stay over there, and he's like, no, I can like really help, and so I really liked that he <laughs> that he did that. Um, one thing that well, there was two things that I wanted to really point out. One was um, uh, I think on the last episode because about D and D, but I know that. In order to do certain actions, you have to roll the dice, correct? Right. Yes. yes. No. Okay. I think so. So, yeah. so, um, so. Hello, everyone. So you, you're probably wondering why did Chris just cut off M Xavier? He's being <laughs> super rude right now, and it's like, no, it's not that. It's not that. No, Craig. The per the rude one was Craig, which is our recording software that we use on uh, on Discord. Discourse had malfunction. Craig malfunctioned. He abandoned us, and we completely lost uh, all of the other audio, which is too bad because we had a really good conversation. Everyone was bringing up some uh, some uh, some cool parts of the uh, the show itself, and I, I loved kind of the discussion of D and D in general during this um, during this episode. And I was so upset. We did post the, the first 18 minutes on the Patreon right now. I did that for free, so I hope you enjoyed it. And so we're just going to continue on where we left off with M. Xavier. This is actually good because, M. Xavier, you, you hadn't uh, seen all the episodes, the last back half of The Legend of Vox Machina. So I'm just going to go ahead and let you go in with your, with, with your general thought, thoughts. What is your opinion on the last back half of episodes of The Legend of Vox Machina? Yeah, sure. So... um I really like the show, or I really like the back half, or I really like the show in general. Mm -hmm. uh, the back half, I think, is really good as well. Um, I one thing I notice is that I do have like subtle complaints about the animation, but I think once they have the fight scenes, that's where like really like um, shows off the, the like the talent that they Definitely. have for the animation. Uh, my favorite character in the show is Pike. Um, I mm. really like her arc. Um, where she's like really like trying to find herself, you know, because like it, it it's like because you see from the first episode where she's like, you know, maybe we should start doing some good things, and everyone's like, nah, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> and then and then when she's um, um, I think you know at the I I think it's the church, and she's like 
you know, um, like I, I want to be, I want to do good things, but maybe mm-hmm. I'm not worthy of this because we do so many shitty things. And she's like really trying to like find herself. And I think once she, or and then once she, you know, understands herself, you know, you see how much of a badass she is. Like the yeah. whole fight with Silas, I'm like, oh, this is amazing. This is incredible. Um, I didn't, I, one complaint I did have is that I didn't like the death of Silas. Um, I, I personally didn't understand it because, um, Grog, right? Yeah. Okay, Grog, he's, he, I think he, like, closes his eyes, and he just, like, swings aimlessly, and somehow, and I guess he's like, oh, okay, this is gonna definitely hit you, and it just, and it hits him, but I'm like, mm, I wish there was more to it, maybe, you know, the whole team gets together or something like that, but it's just a, it's just a slight, um, um, thing that I didn't like. Now, going to the last episode, I was hoping that, because, at the end, you know, we see the cliffhanger where the dragons come through. I was yep. really hoping that the king was that we found out that the king was a dragon and he just like <laughs> turns into one. I would have thought that was that was badass, but uh, but yeah, overall, I, I really love the back half, and overall, I really like the show in general. I'm right there with you. You know, uh, you, you brought up uh, like with Grog swinging uh, wildly when he's fighting Silas. It almost felt like a dice roll. Almost like, well, this character casted this on you and you're blind. He's like, well, now I just mm-hmm. swing wildly at him and you have to do like a skill check or something. Uh, that that kind of mm-hmm. felt like one of those types of scenes. I know they've incorpor- obviously incorporated a lot into the show, but I totally get what you're saying. Um, okay. And yeah, no, the the cliff. I really like, yeah, we'll go into more details about the, the cliffhanger. I know some of the people have brought up beforehand too. I really like that with all these dragons arriving with, with three, which is, you know, kind of going back to uh, those first two episodes where we have um, what General uh, Krieg when he was revealed to be a dragon. So yeah, I like that callback. And it just shows that, okay, there's a lot more threats in this world. And I want to know if they were possibly even involved uh with uh the briarwoods maybe there's a whole cabal of villains that belong to this order you know yeah it leads you know this leads to like a lot more questions but it keeps it very exciting but uh thank you for going over your general thoughts uh we'll go to we'll go ahead and get to luke the boss luke uh what are your general thoughts on the last back half of the legend of vox machina uh i liked it um you know the briarwoods were pretty good villains Mm -hmm. and um, Delilah Briarwood, especially like I think Gray Griffin does a pretty good job, uh, you know, doing her as a character, you know, I th- like. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm losing my train of thought. No, you're good. You're good. No, well, you know, um, I, no, I agree. Like the voice acting. Uh, I think has been impeccable uh, in in this series. And I know a lot of the people that were involved with Critical Role were already a uh, voice actor themselves. I mean, Travis Willingham and Laura Bailey. And I know some of these other people were involved in the creation of uh, cartoons. Uh, I think one of them, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, uh, you can go ahead and pipe up in here. One of them was like behind the, re- the reboot of DuckTales, or they were involved in it in some creative capacity. Uh, Sam Regal was the voice director. Okay, there you go. So yeah, these uh, these guys are uh, absolute professionals, and thank you for bringing up that detail, Deadpool. So and yeah, Greg Griffin, who we we've heard her voice, and I mean, God, I tried. I mean, for what two decades, if not more, at this point, um, playing a, a number of fantastic roles, a lot of villainous roles as well. Uh, I, I heard a little bit of Azula in her voice for yeah. uh, Delia Briarwood. So. No, nah, she's fantastic. And also uh, Matt Mercer, of course, who's also, you know, obviously he's the DM, the dungeon master for Critical Role. He's voicing uh, Silas Briarwood. I think he does a great job, too. Uh, any other thoughts on the show before we go ahead and move on to Vanny, uh, Luke? Oh, just, yeah, I mean, I love how that whole arc wrapped up, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I, it left me wanting to learn more, like, who the Whispered One really is and, like, what's yeah. going what's gonna go on with that. And then... You know, also, of course, the very end with the dragons, how that's going to turn out. So, yeah, I left, mm. it did what a show is supposed to do and leaves you wanting more. So, yeah, I'm interested. I'm glad you mentioned the whispered one because, you know, that's what Silas and Delilah's plan was for all this time, you know, unearthing that ziggurat uh, underneath uh, Whitestone. And, uh, they thought, oh, we're expecting like a dark god to, to come forward and engulf the world in, in pain and misery. And it's just, it's just a spinning ball. <laughs> and she's like, wait, that's it? I kind of love that. <laughs> she was so disappointed. But that ball fucks somebody up. So okay, that ball is evil as hell. It, it vored somebody, ripped yeah. his skin and cartilage and meat and bones until it just, you know, I mean, it ate him. So I'm like, okay, that's probably bad. 
That's probably like a ticking time bomb of some kind. And I, I really like that. That was really funny. Uh, but yeah, moving on uh, to Vanny, Vanny Spears, uh, y- your general thoughts on the last back half of episodes for The Legend of Vox Machina. Uh, it, I think it's because uh, I missed out on the first um, half of the show's uh, discussion, but I, I love the entire mm. thing from start to finish, honestly. Uh, and I think it accomplishes two big things for me. Uh, one was that I, I had heard of Critical Role. I've uh, like seen like very small clips of it, but it was never something that really kind of grabbed my attention. But after watching the show, I immediately went to YouTube and I just started kind of going through the uh, go through the series and really enjoying it. Like, I'm just loving the, their level of professionalism, how much fun they're all having together. And it makes me want to see more of this kind of content now. Because um, part of that, it was really just watching uh, the folks from Penny Arcade when I would go to PAX and they would do their Acquisitions Inc. presentations. So seeing like an even more evolved version of that was really, really exciting to see. Uh, and number two on the same line for it is it makes me want to play D&D so badly mm, uh, now mm. like i want to find a campaign tonight i want to start writing my own campaigns i want to you know immerse myself into that kind of DD lore all over again um and it's all really thanks to that show and it just being i think a lot of the very standard sort of D tropes that you see of um you know like the giant uh like barbarian dude who has a bit of a heart of gold for it a cleric who ha- who's struggling with her faith and her theology because she's enjoying being with this ba- uh, group of bandits and a lot of the stuff that anyone who's ever played D&D before will see, have seen before, but they do it with such passion and with such a spit shine polish that even like some of the, the, uh, the kind of the gripes that I do um, have with the show are generally fairly minor. Um, and I was actually, uh, MZ, you mentioned earlier about uh, when Grog was fighting and he kept his eyes closed. If I'm not mistaken, they didn't, they actually explain that it was like, because um, the Briarwood was able to kind of de- like predict movements because of his eyesight or, and our hypnotized folks. So he kept his eyes closed. So he couldn't actually see that. So it was just swinging wildly was a, was an intentional strategy behind it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, so I think they actually did I explain that. that. Yeah. I think okay, they, cool. Yeah. That's why he was attacking for two. So that way it was, um, if it's too random, then he can't defend. Um, but yeah. And it was, I think at the end of the day, it was, it was, uh, I think really touching. It was really, really funny. And, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier too, is that you can see the moments where like, the characters like in during the campaign will be rolling a one like uh, seeing Vox try to open up a, 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 uh, a door and just absolutely kept failing his uh, his intelligence or uh, I forget what role you have to do for a lock picking, but uh, constantly failing those and separating mm-hmm. the groups and all those kind of tropes that you normally see. But just again, like just so well done. And uh, and it was exciting, too. Um, we talked about this, this part got cut off, but like I looked it up on uh, Rotten Tomatoes and the reviews, even from the user standpoint, the user reviews are really, really high as well. Mm. The folks who didn't like it, the, the kind of, the, I think the most common themes for two was the, I think the idea of like the tropes again, uh, except they were just being very bitter about it. Or if they didn't like the crass sort of um, uh. humor that was in it too. So if you're kind of a little more uptight for it, if you like your D&D much more traditional, it, this will probably upset you for it. Uh, or if you don't, don't like the idea of like adult animation, this is definitely not going to be the show. But um that's really the only major criticisms that I've seen from folks. And um, I even have a friend of mine who's uh, my, one of my best friends. His wife uh, plays D&D too, but she's also, she, she's traditionally very conservative. Mm-hmm. And um, that was her biggest thing is she just found the show to be very crass. Um, this is very so, much an adult animated show. Yeah. Um, so if you don't like it, people saying shit and fuck or uh, <laughs> uh, Scanlan uh, generating a giant middle finger out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, I, I think that's going to be like where it, it's I think your more uh, personal sensibilities uh, or a uh, taste are going to be the um, deciding factor if you're going to like the show or not. But I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I'm glad you brought up like what the reaction to the show has been, because, yeah, I, I haven't really looked up. I haven't I don't think I've read a single review for this show. Uh, <laughs> it's just been I mean, well, talking with you guys about, of course, and your general reactions. And the only other person I know who uh, just disliked it, uh, Martin Thomas of Double Toast, and he just he's just not into Dungeons and Dragons. He just doesn't really particularly care for that. So it's more the D&D aspect that he disliked than I think like even the the humor or even the violence. Uh, but yeah, yeah I, I was just curious. No, thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. And I yeah. agree with you, man. Um, I think we even we, we uh, I talked about this. I think several of us who, who don't play D&D talked about this last time, both uh, in our Lost Part 2 and also in Part 1, where watching the show it it feels it makes D feel really accessible and it makes me want to play 
Um, you know, and it's like, yeah, I want to create my own character and have fun and do all these goofy adventures. I think that'd be, that'd be great. I don't know when I would even have the time to do it or when I could do it or the structure maybe around my own content creation, but I'm right there with you, man. It, it, I think this show is having a really positive impact on, on just the perception of D and D, uh, which, you know, I think maybe has a reputation, uh, of being a little gate, you know, gatekeep, you know, gatekeep, yeah. gatekept from, um, uh, from people so uh i'm 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 liking that this is uh making it more accessible overall but no it looks like all our general thoughts uh we're in we're pretty positive about uh this series overall which is which is fantastic i'm i'm very excited for uh season two like a- everyone else and of course that cliffhanger definitely helps um drum up the excitement but now i kind of want to get into the more uh details about certain moments and characters in the show and there's one character i want to bring up uh first which was scanlan which, you know, I was talking about in, in part one saying like I wasn't a really big fan. I felt like he was just kind of like this one dimensional character where he was that crass character just saying all these things just to to get a laugh or to, for shock value. But I have to say, man, I have to say I am a Scanlan fan now um, where he showed he showcased his competence in this last back half of episodes where Scanlan, I think it was what you you said at Deadpool, maybe it was uh, you, Austin, and he's Scanlan goes commando. It's Scanlan's little adventure where it's like, no, 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 I can handle this entire mansion of uh, soldiers and this 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 general, this commander of the Briarwoods. And he did it and he turned into a, a giant purple triceratops, which I thought was uh, so funny. But we also he also just had his moments like, yeah, everyone underestimates me because of my size and but i i can do these things too and he also had these several wholesome moments i mean he really i mean he he pulls a lot of their asses the entire vox machina's uh, uh asses out of the fire on a number of occasions not only during that whole mansion raid but you have the end in the acid room and i and his i started to warm up to his his, his humor because i saw another side of him I was like okay he's just not this one thing um so yeah i i that was he was kind of like the one person i was pretty iffy on in the in the first half, but I've, I've definitely come around to, but, uh, does anyone else uh, uh, have, did anyone else have that kind of um, realization with Scanlan or you, you realize like, Oh, you actually do like this character after seeing him in the back half. Um, I'd say. No, go ahead. Faye. You can go ahead. Austin. Austin can go and then you can go Casfe. Um, I kind of some points. I was thinking about kind of what you said last time. And I mm-hmm. think, uh, Bards are a very weird class. I, I don't think they are not. I don't. They are very powerful, though. I, I, but Apparently, I think yeah. it, I think it really comes down to a person being creative with them. Mm-hmm. And I think we get to see that a lot with Scanlan and just the uh, how he how even though he's like a pretty much a, a joke, he's almost like the Krillin of the group. You know, he's pretty <laughs> much a joke character. <laughs> he gets laid a lot i mean it's it's all just a lot of crass humor and you know he seems like he really isn't doing it for heroic reasons but you know i think that a uh, solo mission shows you know a uh you know a different side to him as you said yeah. but b but also how just you know even though he's goofy and silly and stuff he's very confident at, at stuff and you know got mm-hmm. any you know turned into a triceratops and took down basically one of the generals, the Briarwoods, that like Goliath guy voiced by the hound. Oh, that's, oh, that's, oh, that's him. Oh shit. It's a, like Rory I, I didn't know. Yeah. 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 Uh, let me look up his, uh, Oh God, Rory, Rory McCann. I did not know that was him. He has Duke Vedmire. Nice. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Um, Caspi, what were you want to say about us? Uh, um, uh, mainly that, Although I never disliked him, mm-hmm. he did quickly have a lot more depth than I thought. I think just in that sense, like after he gave his big speech about, oh, just let me be annoying. I can do this. And he was super, super convincing. It was as he was walking away and on his way there that the anxiety set in and he started to think, can't do this. When I think I predicted that that would happen maybe at the beginning of the fight but he'd rise it to the occasion. But instead, he's immediately like, oh, fuck, why did I say that stuff? Why did I (laughs) volunteer for this? And then he, like, tries to set the place on fire and gets rained on in what I think was definitely, like, a dice-throwing moment. Yeah, definitely. And he's like, shit, you know? And it just, it feels like how I would react to a situation. He bit off more than (laughs) I could chew, but I really want to help. So, it just... 
Yeah, no, exactly. You 100%. No, it definitely humanized him. And I, he felt like a, a, a fully rounded character at that point. I was like, oh, okay. Now, now, now I get it. Cause I know he's, he's beloved. Uh, Sam Regal's uh, Scanlon is, is one of the probably the most popular characters from that initial campaign of Critical. I think Deadpool, you brought this up uh, last time. So uh, Sam Regal, like, he had no real experience with uh, D&D before he started doing this. And like, Scanlon was created as almost like a joke character, right? Yeah, because uh, the whole campaign started as literally a birthday game for Liam O'Brien and Laura Bailey, who happened to have the same birthday. Oh, so they were doing cool. like a like a, a group like uh, like a birthday party for them, and you know they were like they were for years talking about doing some D and D because someone played, someone didn't. So Matt just threw something together, and they created Vox Mach, which originally that's not what the group was called. They were originally called the Shits. No, oh, Jesus. Wow. <laughs> when they, uh, well, I forget what the name stood for. It's, it's an an acro- It's an acronym, and then it just says the shits. And but of course, when they did, were started streaming, they're like, "Yeah, we have to change the name." Yeah, yeah, that, but that yeah. So <laughs> it was just it was just a like a like a fun group thing that they they all had fun doing. They started playing more and more, and then they, they were floating the idea. Hey, why don't we stream this? And they knew uh, Felicia Day because from her doing some voice acting stuff, and she just started Geek and Sundry. And they were looking for content, so they thought, "Hey, right. why not we throw these voice actors on?" And it just kind of slowly started picking up momentum. Like I remember At- the early days where people would just order them pizzas to send to them while they were playing. Oh wow, that's funny. That's cool because I do see them because I've checked out some clips, um, you know, clip compilations, best of and stuff of of Kurt Crow because I was interested after watching Vox Machina and 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 when, and when I was watching as well. Uh, just yeah, they're they're eating uh, constantly, <laughs> like little pizzas and things. So that must have been that. Must have been the fan uh, pizza gift. So that, that's cool. Uh, yeah, no, it's funny, and I just see this character where he started out as a joke, and that's how he was viewed. And he, they, they've really given him so much development, and obviously through yeah. those initial Critical Role campaigns. Yeah, because uh, Liam O'Brien, because like Sam said to Liam, yeah, just I just want to play the dumbest character there is, <laughs> and he's just okay, gnome, bard. So Liam helped him make the character, and pretty mm-hmm. much ever since then, every campaign, Liam literally comes with the idea for the character for uh, Sam to play. He oh, came nice. with this character in campaign two, which is not mm-hmm. the brave, a goblin rogue, and then his newest character, or like automaton cleric in the newer campaign. Right, which I, I'm sure we're eventually going to see animated adaptations of those. I mean, they're currently concentrating on Legend of Vox Machina. I know there's hundreds of episodes. Um, <laughs> you know, of, of, of campaign one. And so I'm I mean, excited think, to that, that we'll, we'll potentially get uh, different iterations of this D and D series. Yeah. At the rate they're going, assuming if they're sticking with just following certain arcs, mm-hmm. we're probably at minimum going to get two, two more seasons of Vox Machina. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, they, they may decide to take some arcs and stretch them out over multiple seasons, but right. we're at minimum getting arc two, which is involves the dragons and then mm-hmm. arc three, which I won't mention because of spoilers. Okay. But we're at least getting two. And oh, right, so they, they may they may branch branch them out to multiple seasons, but now they have sure. Amazon money backing them, so who knows? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I mean they greenlit the second season even before like what the first episodes uh, premiered, so they knew that they, they, Amazon clearly felt like they had a hit on their hands, and they and they do. Well, the first season was all paid for by Kickstarter, like right, within like right. the, like the first couple month first month of it. So, but yeah, wasn't isn't it like one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns of all time? Yep. So yeah. like <laughs> so Amazon just said, yeah, we'll, we're going to pay for season two. Nice, nice. Yeah, so I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised then if they, they, if they have, like you said, they do those two additional seasons. Well, they might expand it. Who knows? But sometimes, yeah, maybe less is less is more in a lot of cases. Right. And it'll be fun to see those other those other characters we don't even know about yet. You know, make their animated debut. Yeah, kind of like Castlevania a little bit. How they did it, where they did the basically like four seasons. It was it again or five? No, they did four seasons, and yeah, and, it, uh, and then it worked now out. they're doing a new and off. Uh, yeah, which is which Our I sequel you know, series. Yeah, which I assume they could really do for campaign two, and I would I would be really cool down for that because I think they could. Uh, I think because campaign two is all stream, it's all online. It's also a little, uh, in story wise, it was a lot less improv and a lot more like they had time to prepare and like kind of set up characters and. Oh, right, and gotcha. Yeah. Cool. No, that makes that makes me really excited. So yeah, I think this is just going to be a whole new franchise that is uh, going to be a part of uh, the Amazon brand for quite some time. Uh, moving on from, from Scanlon, say anyone else has anything else they want to say about Scanlon beforehand, if they had a change of heart, like, uh, like I did. I always oh. loved the character. I thought he was fun. 
Yeah. And, and I think to Austin's point too, like, I think when you think Bard, you think of just the guy in the background who sings songs to boost the party and that's about it. But yes, he was exactly. Very tactical, very useful uh, throughout the whole thing too. And again, just a great example of what you, when you play D and D like creativity can sometimes trump the rules or the expectations uh, and you can just make it your own. So I, I really have always appreciated the character. Yeah, I think that is just like a, a general um, stereotype of bards. Like, yeah, they're the guy that sings. They buff the party, and that's really it. In the most part, they're weak. But yeah, they can, as clearly showcased in this uh, in this animated series, they can save your ass. Literally, pull it out of boiling acid. So that yeah. was pretty cool. Scaling Moving on hand. from yeah, that's right, scaling hand. What was he Bigsby hand? He calls it like different things. Uh, <laughs> Moving on from Scalin, I did want to talk about uh, the villains of the show, specifically uh, the Briarwoods, uh, Silas and Delilah. And I liked it that they just weren't mustache trolling villains, even though they were doing horrific things throughout this entire series. I did like that. At least they spent the time explaining how they got to where they are. And of course, it's based in tragedy and, and love corrupted, I think. And where I love that, uh, I forget what episode it was of the back half, but we saw why Delilah and why Silas became what we see them later on in the series where Silas is dying of some type of disease and um, typical remedies and medicine magic can't help him. And Delilah makes a deal with the, um, with this, um, this God with the whispered one, as it's called, I believe the whispered one. Mm -hmm. yep. And, um, basically says yeah fuck the world it's all about us and so their corruption is it's its origin point is through love but you know that's no excuse for you know what the, the things that they do but i at least i i at least appreciate that they humanize them and they weren't just mustache twirling villains and i like that you know you can make someone a vampire without having to be someone have someone bit by a vampire i was like oh that's kind of cool yeah with dark magic and things I thought that was neat but um, yeah, I, I and it, again, Matt Mercer and uh, Delilah, uh, excuse me, and Gray Griffin did a fantastic job of voicing both respective characters since they're accomplished voice actors in, in their own right. But I just want to kind of open it up to everyone else. What was uh, everyone's opinions on the uh, the Briar Wards and their relationship and how they were handled throughout this uh, season? I liked where it was. It's that nice mix of they do give them a, a good reason for why they're doing what they're doing. But at the same time, at no point you're, are you ever supposed to feel sorry for them either. Mm, mm, and mm, it's kind point. of almost like how in Disney films now, like a lot of the villains are more like being misunderstood or sometimes there's not even really one at all. Like uh, in Encanto where it's just there isn't a villain. It's just a house. Um, so Grandma's I, the goddamn villain. I don't yeah. mean to interrupt you, but a no, whale but yeah. is the villain of that no, movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I like the fact that they they humanize them uh, just enough where, where you don't feel sorry for them either too. It's sure. just, they are, they, they do have a bit of that mustache twirling for it, but it's also earned too. And you're still supposed to hate them. Oh, yeah. Um, like when, when they die, you don't ever feel like, Oh man, if they only like, there's no final tear at the end or something like that, or I'm sorry, nothing. It's just, they're bad. Like they had a good idea that they took way too far. I like uh, how they both go out. Uh, one Silas mm -hmm. just gets Kamehameha hot to death <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> by, by Keyleth. I love that. Ah, by sunlight beam. Uh, yep. And then what, I mean, late uh, Delia Briarwood, I mean, one, yeah, I mean, she's shot the shit and then obviously uh, stabbed and everything um, uh, in the neck. And I love that they just boil her body in acids. Like, yeah, we're gonna make sure she's dead, yep. which uh, I, I just really like that visual because yeah, you, you, you want that because of all the horror they've caused people, all the suffering. I was like, yes, they deserve it. Um, mm -hmm. It was just a cool visual. Anyone else, anyone uh, want to uh, speak about the, the Briarwoods or a moment that you thought was cool with them? Yeah, my favorite moment with the Briarwoods is just the just the moment where uh where Silas gets killed and Lady Briarwoods mm -hmm. like you can't I broke the world for us. Right. It's just right. like you just feel it and it's just such a good dramatic moment. Yeah, it's like everything that she was doing uh up until that point was to yeah, prolong each other's lives and to keep their their love, you know, immortal, if you will. And then she lost it at the last minute. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> fuck. It's like, what was the point of all this? It's like, oh God, you did, that just must just piss you off. Be exhausting. Um, I thought that was very funny too. I was like, yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> but yeah, no, overall, I, I, I really liked the Briarwoods. I thought they were uh, uh, great villains. And it's like, okay, I'm interested to see what you got next of these, these, these dragons and who the, the potential threats are in, in, in latter seasons because they were, they were pretty cool. And I loved also, I mean, just to bring up briefly, I mean, I think we did talk about this last in, in the part two that is now lost to time. 
but we did have a whole supporting cast of villains as well, which we, again, we just brought up Rory McCann as Duke of Vedmire, who was just this really physically imposing uh, a threat. Obviously, you know, he kills Percy's uh, friend, his little dwarf friend. Uh, you know, I think either, yeah, it was in the back half of these uh, last six episodes. But also, I mean, we mentioned beforehand Stephen Root as uh, the professor to um, uh, Percy and Cassandra, Professor Anders. Uh, well, I mean, it's Stephen Root, and he's already fantastic, uh, a, a wonderful actor, been doing this for like 30 plus years now, and obviously, you know, a very skilled voice actor. But I just loved his ability, like that silver ton that he has, and is able to take, take control of those, like, um, those uh, steel golems and then the other party members. I thought that was just a really cool, just animated segment and him just, you know, monologuing the whole time then literally having his fucking jaw shot off. No. And there's something about that where he's just holding on to his meat as all everything's dripping and just pouring out of him. It's like, oh, what a, what a, what a visual. But uh, any, any thoughts on some of those uh, other, whether it be the Brywoods or any of the other supporting villains in the show? Uh, just that thing with the professor's tongue getting mm. like crawling around the room after he gets <laughs> shot, and like it was there was it was a very humorous sort of symbolism, I think, and the way everyone was like WTF, uh, <laughs> get it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I love that. The like what Grog was the one that stabbed. Just like got it. <laughs> what happened to that thing? Did they did they kill it? Did they keep it? I'm curious about that. Yeah, how did I, 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 what was the procedure? Because I, you know, I, I start thinking about like, okay, how did they, he get that? How did that get put in his mouth? His old tongue guy had to get replaced. Obviously, just gross shit. Um, and I just love how Percy took him out. It was like fuck, really scary. And just you know, speaking of Percy, um, you know, he's my favorite character in this series overall. No mercy, Percy, as I think the critical role fan base uh, loves to call him. And um, I mean, he definitely gets the most development. I mean, his his backstory w is within Whitestone and it is, is with the Briarwoods and his entire trauma. But, you know, this last back half, we finally learned about, you know, what has been forcing him to seek this vengeance for all these the, these years. And it's this demon Orthax. And I like how in that last episode. It wasn't dealing. Yes, it was dealing with the aftermath of the Briarwoods and everything. But we we did we had the big fight with the Briarwoods in episode twelve, right? Or uh, no, excuse me, episode eleven. There's twelve episodes in the Latin in the, in the Pendleton episode, and then everything else was the fall and dealing with Percy and trying to save his soul from this demon. And I really loved one the animation and going within Percy's own mind and his spirit to fight this creature, and um, just his family trying to help him his friends and family trying to help him th through this entire process any any thoughts on on percy Dorolo and his demon companion orthax i'm just glad that they didn't do the whole like because i was i was like are they gonna do it or they're like he's like oh i can keep this gun because the demon's oh, gone yeah. out and then later on in another season it was going to make, a, you know, it was going to come back. I was like, please don't do that. And they, <clears throat> they ended up not doing it. I was like, yes, finally. Because I was like, Duh. I, I love, I love that uh, part because, um, yeah, he's about to pick it up. And then Scam's like, ah, but, 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 no, 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 no. And he's like, it's okay, man. The demon's gone. He's like, all right, nah, fuck it. And he throws in the acid. And yeah. like, nothing happens. He gets mad. And then the demon goes, Wah! I was like, oh, shit. How would you know that? Uh, I do as a guess. Yeah, <laughs> I that thought was that was really Total guess. funny. Total guess. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Matt Mercer planned for that to happen. Oh. Like he was going to come back. And Sam's like, nope. And just chucks in the ass. Oh, yeah. that is hilarious. And he's like, damn it, you, you, my plans, all my plans. That's funny. No, I, I love that. Um, and again, you're kind of ending on a humorous note, too, despite all the horrific trauma. Uh, I think I brought this up last time. I forgot, though, because um, in order to break himself out of that trance, um, you know, because when he's confronted with um, uh, Vex and, um, you know, clearly, which I, I, I believe they're they're setting up a romance between the two of them. I just I just get that sense. You know, he's calling him darling and things. I, I guess he calls other people darling. But, I, you know, clearly he has a connection to her. And she could the fact that she's the one that confronted him trying to stop him from murdering everybody. But um that one scene when he like shoots his own hand and he got, he has like a, does he have like a mechanical hand now? Or what is that thing? So oh, his cool. hand. I think those are his, they might be an item he gets later. Cause I know okay. at a well, point he gets he like, has it in this campaign in in this arc, but they didn't, for, they didn't do anything with it. Mm. Um, Cause that didn't play out during the campaign at all. 
He okay. didn't shoot his hand. So that's something they added. But, um, okay. He does have this device he made called uh, – it's a pair of gloves called Diplomacy. Mm-hmm. And okay. if you, you grab somebody's hand, you can electrocute them with it. Oh, that's like cool. Like he oh, made it as a weapon to take on the Briarwoods that he could secretly use to try to kill them mm, mm, during mm. during the whole dinner thing. But for whatever Ooh. reason, they never created that. So I'm guessing that's what it is, because that crystal that's in the hole where his hands are, it looks like one of the crystals from the they made from the white stone. Oh, yeah, which they keep they kept running up. It's the uh, they, they're like because Professor Anders was obsessed with mining that material. Redulum, what was it called? Read them. Oh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, residuum? residuum residuum yeah so okay yeah, i guess he has this so it obviously has magical property because they use it to like bring the ziggurat back to life mm-hmm. so okay that's cool that's cool yeah no like i like i said um percy is just such a fascinating character i imagine they'll they'll start to explore some of the other uh uh members of uh vox machina in the future i mean he definitely I mean, he definitely got the 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 majority of development, I think, in this particular arc and season. I imagine that'll continue on uh, later on, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of shift their focus to someone else. But anyone else have any thoughts on on uh, Percy in general? Uh, yeah, I think last time I I mentioned that um, the whole thing with the gun and the smoke and everything back before it was revealed to be a demon, we were talking about. Oh yeah, that's so cool. He's such an interesting character, and the gun's mm. so badass. But then it turned out, oh wait, that's not a good thing for him to be doing that. <laughs> and it, it got to a point at the end where he was turning it on people that he loves, and he yeah. wasn't sure what was real and what wasn't. And I thought that was an excellent um, metaphor for trauma and what it can do to a person, and how it's not a good thing to romanticize that sort of thing. So I just I'm interesting to see what his character is going to look like now that he doesn't have that anymore, and then he's just going to be Percy without all of the the angst and the black smoke and everything, or maybe yeah. some angst, but not toxic, you know? Yeah. It's like, how is he going to deal with his trauma? I mean, you know, he, he does, he does look happier mm-hmm. by the end of this season where, you know, before he was always kind of very, um, you know, off to the side and uh, closed off. I think with a lot of people like maybe now, I mean, he'll probably still have, I mean, you know, years of trauma. That's, it's not something you're going to get over uh, quickly. Um, but he does seem to be in a, in a, in a better place. And so I wondered then if he's going to be able to open up and be more of a friend or a family member within Vox Mach. It's interesting. It's interesting. There's just, just a lot of possibilities they can further explore. And I know these have already been explored in critical for people that just haven't watched it. It's like, ah, it's, it's exciting. So I'm right there with you. Um, you know, of course, anyone else wants to bring anything up, uh, else about yeah. person. This kind of leads into this. Oh, do you want to say something, Fanny? Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I think it kind of depends on how the next season plays out and how much time that they just have to let the characters breathe. Because it looks like the yeah. season two, episode one, is going to go right into some major destruction for it, too. Mm. So um, it may mm. be either a couple episodes or they may shift the focus uh, less to Percy, maybe now more to uh, the twins now, too, since that uh, uh, the dragons point. are much more tied into them as well. So I think they uh, that's kind of one of, the, of uh, when I look at the critical role episodes, like when they're three to four hours long. That gives them a lot more time to work out, like uh, a lot of the logistics uh, background stuff, or to give them more time for character growth and breathing. And again, it, it kind of depends on the direction they want to go with season two. If they do, they want to make it more action oriented, and do they feel like they've kind of built enough for the characters at this point where they can just kind of toss them to the shit for a season, or that could be it. I, I do think, to your point, we're going to see a happier or more calmer um, Percy and just and his new pepper box, which I I love the name of that for a gun. Oh but, yeah, it is. Um, it's a slick name. Yeah, I like that yeah. too. Um, but yeah, it, I could see them also just kind of putting him in the background for a little bit and, uh, giving the, uh, another character, uh, time to shine. Yeah, no, right there with you. Um, I, I, and you're right. I'm glad you actually brought up this. That's what I was thinking of. Just give me a second. Yeah, I think you're right. They're going to maybe focus more on Vex and Vax since, you know, they have their, that whole traumatic past with the dragons that killed their family. So I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. Cause I forgot. Cause what, what's her name? Vex. She, she can sense dragons when they approach. It looks like she gets a headache or something. So I was like, oh, okay. That yep. makes a lot of sense. Um, moving on from that, I just kind of want to talk about just like our favorite moments just throughout the entire series overall, you know, not just the, the back half uh, episodes, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll speak first and I'll just, you know, open up the floor to everybody else. You know, I, I really liked, you know, the whole animated segment when they fought, fought the dragon in the, in the, in the second episode, I thought that was beautiful. I think that's like, oh, you're really showcasing this animation now. And um, I also kind of like 
how they showed the intelligence of the characters in regards to the acid trap in the mm. last few episodes where everyone had a specific job. Everyone was doing something that helped the party. And I thought that was really interesting, whether it was Scanlan losing his hand to keep everyone above the boiling acid or Grog because he has that natural resistance. He can go in the acid and swim down there and do the lock while Pike heals him consistently. I thought, oh, this is just really, really clever how everyone's getting something to do. I thought that was really nice. And um, I just like that weird fucking orb that just sucks people's skins off. I don't know. So about that, I was yeah. like, whoa, <laughs> it just surprised me. But does anyone else have like a, a moment or like throughout the entire season that, wow, this was really, really cool and it just kind of stuck with you? Um, I have two moments. One of them is kind of more of a joke, but it goes to, for me and Dun the mo it's one of, one of the, in the first episodes is when they lose all that loot. And mm, the, mm. I'm a, my, my friends and I, I'm like, the, there's a bit of a joke of me being a loot goblin. And I'm like, I was very <laughs> sad when they lost all that loot. And I'm like, they spent so much money on it. Right. But, but it, that, that is very true. And the other one was the fight between Pike and, uh, Lord Briarwood. Oh yeah. Or Silas. Yeah. Cause that was just very well animated. And I, I don't remember if I said this on the first one or not, but I just love the idea that you don't really get, you always see characters that usually kind of match each other in like uh size and like honest uh, body types in, in fights mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. And this one is uh, someone who's much shorter versus someone who's much taller and like uh, broad uh, to say. And I just, I, I just love how they animate it and just like they kind of uh, showcase it. Yeah, it was like a Dragon Ball fight, <laughs> which I like. I, I don't say that with any negative connotations. Like I, I dug that where she's blasting him with her Everlight magic and he's using his his giant blood sword, which I thought was really freaking cool. By also, the way. Gr Grog getting that blood sword was was very cool. And I'm excited what? to see where that goes. I know what that is because I've seen clips online. I'm like, oh, that's the thing everyone loves. And I was like, OK, that's going to be I'm, I'm really just to see how they're going to animate that because i've seen animations of him with that sword i'm like okay this is gonna be pretty interesting so no yeah great point yeah oh yeah when pike comes back in the last back half and she's you know she's found herself and she's more confident than ever and you know and knows what she wants i really like that plus i like ashley johnson she does this thing where you know pike, we think of like because she's like, like a cleric right that's her whole thing like a paladin cleric or something and she'd also be like holier than than anything but i like how she still talks like just like hey motherfuckers like I, that, that, that's just really funny <laughs> Um, like even earlier on this in the in the series in the first episode when like her and Grog are drinking during the banquet and she's like, "What are you looking at, doofus?" And I thought that was funny. <laughs> I, really, I really like that. I like J Ashley Johnson in general. I think she just has a. I mean, one, she's uh, incredibly talented, but I like that she has that comedic timing. It appeals to me. Uh, anyone else favorite um, moment or sequence character or character stuff in the in the series overall? Oh, uh, I really. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Caspay. Go with Caspay, and then we'll go with Vanny. Um, I, I really like the way that uh, Keyleth has come into mm. her own and how, in some ways, it's like while Pike was going through her journey, Keyleth also had to go through hers because Pike wasn't there. So right. it's... Um, you know, she had these moments where she was stumbling, and that was really relatable, but then there were moments where she was going... Like she was practically sacrificing herself in multiple scenes and just giving it her all. And I just, I don't know. I just, I, I knew she was going to be stronger than what people expected. And I like, uh, I think it was mentioned before, like how she and Vex eventually came to like each other. Cause I don't think yeah. Vex took her very seriously or appreciated the interactions between her and Vax. And I just, the, her, her whole development was great. Yeah, I, I really like Keyleth too, and where she was always dealing with her lack of self confidence, but she literally grew as a, as a character, and she became more powerful and saved the group on a, on a number of occasions. And I think either Osnick or you, Deadpool, had brought this up in the past, but the character who voice, or excuse me, the person who voices Keyleth, Mar Marisha Ray, I, I believe her name is, um, like I guess the fan base was kind of like really hard on her because she didn't have that much. Um, you know, exposure to D and D. Is that true? Well, I was I was actually doing some research, additional research about this uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I have everybody. She caught the most flack and the uh. most toxic harassment that of everyone because it was a couple of reasons why. Mm. One, back then, 
D and D wasn't the most inclusive as, it, as it's right. starting to become now. It was. It's usually. It, it. It. I mean, for the most part, it still is. Uh, like a straight yeah. white guy, nerdy like demographic. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. seeing these, seeing you know women play this, like you're going to get a certain uh, element of negativity towards them. Right. Some very toxic like bullshit. And so she, of everyone at the table, she was new to D and D. Um, like a handful of other players, she's a woman, and she's dating Matt Mercer. So right, a lot of right, people right. were just giving her flack for all that for just just pointless stuff. And on top of that, her character of Keyleth is supposed to be this sort of uh, this like 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 new to the world, homeschooled kid. I don't know anything. I don't really know much about the outside world. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, almost like heavily based off of Aang from, from uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Right, I remember you mentioned that. She, right. Yeah, she was a big fan of the show. Mm-hmm. She loved Avatar. Wanted a character like Aang, and that's where the Shari come from because they they protect the elemental rifts. So there's four tribes: Earth, Wind, Water, Fire, and she is Kila of the Air Shari, right. like Aang of the Airbenders. And it's funny enough, the studio who does the animation did the animation for the intro for Avatar The Last Airbender. Nice. You could definitely tell they have a similar aesthetic. That's really cool. Yeah. So, and one of the great things about the show is, the, like, so, like, you know, you, know, you have Mercia Ray, who's still new to D&D, trying to figure stuff out. Mm-hmm. And her, she's playing a character who's kind of a little bit of a klutz and kind of ditzy because she's, you know, trying to figure her way out in the world. Right, too. right. So she caught a lot of that flack, but the show really just kind of distilled the character down a lot more. So mm. you, you got a lot of the stuff where it's just, you know, with D&D, people are going to be stumbling over stuff, misunderstanding oh, sure. how stuff works. Of course. But with the show, you're able to kind of refine the character more, showing mm. here's all the highlights without any of the, the weird, goofy stuff some of the, sometimes the players do by mistake. Yeah, so I like really inter- Oh, I'm ahead. sorry. Keep, keep going. No, no, no. Keep going. So like yeah, it's 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 really interesting seeing how people are reacting to Keyleth now, especially mm-hmm. with how much heat she got when the show was streaming, versus now when everyone's just saying how grave a character she is. So there's that really that the interesting where it's like, oh, it's just, it's just one because the demographic's changing, and two, it's mm. we're seeing a more refined version of the character. Yeah, no, I, I'm well, you know, it's sad to hear that that's what you know she was getting all that flack initially, but. Yeah, I, I like the character instantly. I like that she was kind of a, a, a dork. She's like a dorkable. And so um, I, I really I really like that with her. And I'm glad that Marisha Ray is not getting as much hate now. That's just, that's just awful. So, yeah. So I'm right there with you, Casfe. I think she's, um, she's she's a great character and she's getting more confident. I mean, we're just seeing the humble beginnings of this group and them dealing with all their various issues. So, you know, I mean, I think it, it, it's weird. Like, I think the last thing I want to see is just a show where everyone's super overpowered and knows exactly what they're doing all the time. And then that's not interesting to watch. I mean, they like to watch things where the characters struggle. That's where the drama is, you know? So it's just kind of bizarre that you have these people that come in here. It's like, it needs to be perfect. It's like, no, it doesn't. The sloppiness is is kind of fun because it's like, oh, they're, they're like me. They're like a fuck up like me, which I think is funny. Um, Vanny, you wanted to uh, say something. Yeah, my favorite scene, uh, hands down, is Vax is trying to pick a lock. Oh, yeah. Percy gets pissed off, says, like, fuck this, I'm going to go find a window. Mm-hmm. He fails his, de- mm-hmm. his dex check or his athletics check, falls, and then he's just like, I try to climb a window. Yeah. And then <laughs> the guard opens the door to dump out the bucket of piss. And I think, like, one of the, the I think, appealing things about the show is everybody looks so goddamn cool. And to see them just be covered in pee and Vox, yeah. like, screwing up constantly... It just works so well, and it's it reminds people why this show is so great, why these characters are so uh, loved and endeared, because they, they're not that one-note, uber-powerful. Like, they're not all a bunch of Drizz Dordans. Like, they mm. have personality and flaws, and they can fuck up sometimes, too. Like, uh, a thief who can't pick a lock. Yeah, or, the, com- or the competent, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say, just it's just a comedy of errors, the entire sequence. It's yep. like one after the other. And that's what happens in D&D campaigns, uh, you know, where you can't, you, you, you need to get a certain check with the, with the dice, a certain, you know, number. And it's like, I failed. And you, yep. you, you do do other things. Ah, that failed too. So yeah, I thought that was, um, I thought that was a, just a great way to showcase the struggle of playing a D&D campaign. But this is also just being a really funny animated sequence, a, little, mm-hmm. a great bit of comedy. So yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Yeah, overall, I mean, just kind of, unless anyone else has anything else they want to bring up, like a favorite moment or a sequence of a character or even something like more subtle, like a conversation. Um, um, please, please I, do so. I really, I still really liked the uh, episode four, uh, mm-hmm. even after watching all the 
the rest of the whole series. Um, I just think episode four. I think episode so episode four was when they had was like kind of like their horror episode where they had the oh yeah story. yes you're just sucking the souls out of people. Um, and I feel like episode three really showcased how you know at the how how good the animation can be with the with the fight scene with Silas. And I feel like episode four just showed how grotesque this show can really be. Yeah. Um, I've mentioned um, like off mic one time where like there's a part in that episode where uh, one of the ghosts like like grabs someone by their like claws and while they're sucking the um when they drag them on the wall but they're still like sucking the like soul out of the mm-hmm. out of the being and it just looks so um it looks so horrifying and so yeah. that's one thing graphic. that I, that really yeah very graphic and so that's one thing that stuck out to me about the whole series in general is because i know everyone's been mentioning how how uh you know gruesome and how mature this, this show is um but yeah the just the brutality really stuck out to me you know, it also is in those sequences where I actually, because I, I know like, well, you, when we watch a cartoon, it's like, well, it's an animated cartoon. These characters are going to make it through, but everything. But with D- Dungeon Dragons, like anyone could die at any minute. That's mm-hmm. the thing. You're like, you don't really know. And like, I thought when like when they when that that first specter ghost, whatever the hell it was, jumped on Scanlan, started just like sucking his stuff out of him. And then also he was vomiting this black goo. And then with mm-hmm. Keyleth, I remember her being on the wall and going Aah! and everything. Like she was having <laughs> like a massive seizure. It's like, Jesus. And it's like, yeah, like, yeah, any of these guys can die, really, when you think about it. It could be shocking because it's, because it's so violent. And I guess I'm just used to that, with, expecting with the Amazon animated programs in general, where it's just like with Invincible and how brutal. Like, it can be super wholesome and fun and, you know, really focus on the comedy. And then, like, 20 minutes later, oh, half the cast is dead. And so, like, you just don't know. Like, that's why I kind of feel with, uh, with Vox Machina, like, it could surprise me any, any time. And I really do feel anxious, like watching uh, this series and particularly, yeah, particularly that episode where I thought, Oh Jesus Christ, how the hell are they going to get out of this? So yeah, mm-hmm. gr- great example to bring up. Great. Um, excellent. Moment. Definitely one of my favorites, certainly of the, of the first half of, another, of the season. Another thing I wanted to mention was uh, when they, Please. I like how at the last episode where we were talking about how the guy gets like um, when they're with the sphere, when they're like, oh, someone's checking on it. And then <laughs> the guy grabs it and he like gets his like body ripped apart. Ugh. For some reason that reminded me of, uh, I think, Jumanji when 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 uh, the kid is like, getting, <laughs> like dragged into the board. Yeah, game. I was I like, that. oh, shit, this, this is this is kind of cool. But yeah, which is scary as all hell. That scene, Jumanji, when like yep. Will Robin Williams like ah! and the girl like fucking runs out like, oh, my God. And she becomes like a reclusive cat lady after that. Yeah, no, I yeah, I, I could see why you you would definitely uh you would definitely see that because yeah, I see it too. Nice. Any other um thoughts? On anyone else? Moment, sequence, character thing in regards to the show before we wrap up. Uh, the part where um, well, actually, two scenes with the character of Cassandra. Uh, mm-hmm. One, the villain reveal, especially like with Percy's gun and everything, where her name yeah. just shows up on there. That was an intense scene. Although I do like how she eventually came around later, and it turned out she was just being controlled. So, mm-hmm. like, the part also at the end where she kills Delilah, where even though Percy didn't do it and that wasn't a good idea for him, you know, Cassandra gets her mid sentence while she's, you know, going on and on about how she's going to come back stronger than ever or some shit. But with the way it keeps building, I'm like, okay, something's going to happen to her. And it was such a funny, but also epic moment. And she's just like, well, glad you could forgive her, but I could not. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good moment. I yeah. As soon as she started monologue, I'm like, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> You're gonna get stabbed in the throat. And did you have a, like another moment as well? You said there was two moments. Oh, you oh the with the gun and oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah, with the gun and then of that. Totally, totally agree. Um, yeah, no, I I liked. I imagine we'll, there'll be a number of those moments as we get into season two. It has me uh very excited. Yeah, the writing in the show is just so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luke the boss, I think I hear some reverb coming from your end. Oh, sorry. No problem. No problem at all. Uh, but yeah, did anyone else have any other moments they wanted to uh, bring up before we wrap this uh, wrap up this episode? Which I think, as far as I know, Craig is still recording. I've been going back like every <laughs> uh, every minute just to make sure he's working. I didn't see any errors so far. I, th- I think I think we're good. Yep, I think we're good. But anyone else want to bring something up? Uh, Box yeah, and let's flipping each other off. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, that was very funny. Deadpool, did you want to say something, too? Yeah, just, well, my one of my favorite parts of Campaign 1, when they did the live stream, was the Scanlan Commando mission. 
That was right. always one of my favorite parts. So it was really interesting seeing how they um, adapted it to the to an episode because because it was pretty much a full like four hour session that of, of them doing that. So it's interesting how they restructured what have happened because originally Scandal just shows up, turns into the Triceratops, and bashes his way into the, the place, finds out it's an ambush, and then just kind of like kills a bunch of guys, turns back to the gnome, and just basically just is chased around the manor until he eventually gets onto the roof, takes his potion, just sets everything on fire, and then gets in a showdown with uh, the big like Goliath guy on the roof. So it's interesting how they restructure that and how it still works. I mean, I recommend if you guys ever want to at least watch a full episode, like watching Scanlon's little commando uh, mission episode, it's just it's just so entertaining. Nice. Which the funny thing is at the same time, because every year on Hall- around Halloween, like the, the their close episode to Halloween, they dress up in costumes. Mm. Like every year it's a different theme. And that year, Scanlon, uh, well, Sam Regal dressed up as Burt Reynolds. So he's uh, from like smoking the bandit because throughout the show, he has a running joke where his fake identity is a lawyer named Burt Reynolds Esquire. So that was kind of a running joke during the show. So he actually dresses up as Burt Reynolds with the hat and mustache. And I think during the, he goes, you know, Burt Reynolds will, will, uh, you'll leave when Burt Reynolds lets you leave. Very nice. <laughs> I like that. No, and I imagine we'll see some of those in jokes as we go uh, uh, in, into later seasons. But yeah, no, I think overall, I think we were all pretty big fans of the legend of Vox Machina uh, when it, whether it comes to the animation or the writing or the voice <laughs> acting. I mean, they're firing at all cylinders. It, it has me very excited. And hey, to know that we're getting a season two, that has me anticipating even more. But uh, yeah, I think we can go ahead and wrap this up. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just hoping Craig recorded this this time. You guys will know in a bit. <laughs> I'll let you know. We'll, we'll check it out. But again, hey guys, seriously, thank you for redoing this. Uh, we'll, um, we'll start doing some new stuff for next week. Again, uh, feel free to submit any um, recommendations for topics. It would be awesome. But until then, thank you and bye. Bye 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 bye.